that made Milwaukee famous presents The Halls of Ivy, starring Mr. and Mrs. Ronald Coleman. Good evening, this is Ronald Coleman. And Benita Coleman. Inviting you to join us again on the campus of Ivy College as the guests of our sponsors, the Brewers of Schlitz Beer. The taste of Schlitz. The taste so many people prefer has made Schlitz beer first in sales in the USA. If you like good beer, do as millions of people are doing all over the nation. Ask for Schlitz, the most popular beer in history. And now, the Halls of Ivy. Welcome again to Ivy. Ivy College, that is, in the town of Ivy, USA. The first few weeks of every new college season more or less resemble a shakedown trip on a newly launched cruiser. Faculty and students must learn their battle stations. Also, it's a good thing to know how to approach the big guns and for the big guns to clear their sights. The biggest gun at Ivy College, Dr. William Todd Hunter Hall, president, is just finishing lunch at home with Victoria Hall, his wife, former ornament of the London stage. Well, Jordy, you're not through. Well, you hardly had a thing. Oh, I'd hardly say that, my darling. I think I can sustain myself till dinner time. I've had tomato juice, an omelette, a salad, and two and a half cups of coffee. Well, I know, but no cheese on the omelette, no sugar in the coffee. It's just bulk, no energy. Look, I've got a nice chocolate cake. No, 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 please. <laughs> no, no, not that I scorn your chocolate cake, but um, uh, this morning's attempt, and I must admit failure, to touch my piggy wiggies with my paddy waddies was a stern warning. <laughs> <laughs> and may I add, darling, that your omelette was a culinary triumph. Whenever I essayed an omelette, it came out of the pan like a thin, lethargic child getting out of bed to go to school. <laughs> How do you make them so light? Well, it's a secret recipe, except that it requires half a pint of helium. Well, <laughs> how, um, how was your morning? Well, there's a rumor around the campus that a quiz kid is at large. Oh, really? Has he got a sponsor? <laughs> I don't know, but, uh, <laughs> but a rash of odd, tricky, and embarrassing questions has broken up. Professor Underhill, for instance, was checking a query that Professor Sterling couldn't answer, which had been posed by somebody else, and so on down the line. For what? Why does the North Magnetic Pole move around? Maybe to keep warm way up north there like that. <laughs> I didn't know it did. Why does it? Oh, it just does, that's all, and that's a question to which there is no other answer at the moment. Hmm. Of course, there were other questions which required sensible answers, such as... Uh, why don't fish drink water? Perhaps. Not even a sensible question. They do. I watch them. They swim underwater and open and close their mouths all the time. They have to drink water, whether they want to or not. <laughs> uh, that, that, that's not drinking, Vicky. That's breathing. Hmm? Yeah, the fish opens his mouth to pass water through the gills to obtain oxygen. Very little, if any, passes into his stomach. Oh. Well, in other words, if you drink like a fish, you're not really drinking at all. <laughs> And who's the false fish who'd ask a question like that in the first place? <laughs> I don't know, but, but some of the questions are real challenges. Simple ones that you'll hear all the time and take the answers for granted. Well, I'm pleased to learn that the spirit of interrogation is alive on the campus. Our mental classes can become so cluttered that we forget to ask ourselves why. Why the sky is blue, the grass is green. Why we're here. And where we're going, and what we are, and who... And who is who? Who do you think? <laughs> I don't know, but I wish we could answer all our questions by simply turning a doorknob. <clears throat> Dr. Hall? Yes? I was told I could find you here at your home, and since this is a pressing matter, uh, uh, my name is Yates, Addison Yates. Oh. Uh, I'd like to speak to you. Well, come in, Mr. Yates. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, this must be kept confidential, of course. Now, this is Mrs. Hall, Mr. Yates. Uh, Mrs. Hall, how do you do? Oh, Mr. Yates, I want you to sit down. Uh, yes, thank you. <clears throat> I'm going to be frank with you, Dr. Hall, but it must not go any further. Well, it's difficult to go further with something which hasn't yet started, Mr. Yates. <laughs> uh, have you a son or daughter here at Ivy? No, a mother. 
And something must be done about her. Your mother? My mother. I've tried my very best to cope with her, but I seem to have failed. Dr. Hall, I want you to get rid of my mother. <laughs> really? Well, that's a rather sinister ring, Mr. Yates. Do uh, you wish me to use fair means or foul? <laughs> Please, it's not an amusing situation, to me at least. Well, I, I'm trying to identify your mother. Her name is Felicia Yates. Felicia Yates. Felicia, uh, Victoria, do you... No, uh... no, I'm sorry. But unless she's the new house mother over the uh, Tridel. She is not a house mother. She is my mother. <laughs> <laughs> and a student. Oh, it's ridiculous. My mother's been living with Genevieve and myself for years. She loves our children. It's been an ideal family unit. And then suddenly she announces that she's leaving us to go to college. At her age. Oh, Mr. Yates, I can't quite understand your perturbation. Advancing years do not necessarily indicate a receding mentality. But she's a grandmother. She's not a co-ed. <laughs> if she's a female going to a co-educational college, she's a co-ed if she's 106. <laughs> Face it, Mr. Yates. I won't quibble about nomenclature. The fact remains that the whole thing is ridiculous. Why, think of the newspaper stories when it leaks out. Uh, date bait at 78. <laughs> or Phi Beta Grammar. <laughs> Pictures in the headlines. And the worst part of it is she'll probably love every bit of it. <laughs> I, I'm beginning to admire this lady more by the minute. Uh, uh, what do you want me to do? Well, send her home. You're the president. Well, even so, I haven't the power to reject or expel anyone without proper cause. If your mother is already enrolled as a student here, she must have had the necessary credentials and have passed the entrance examination. I was hoping you'd cooperate with me in putting an end to this farcical idea. Well, I'm tremendously disappointed. Good day, sir. Good day, Mrs. Uh, Hall. Goodbye. Goodbye, Mr. Yates. Never was I so pleased to see you disappoint anyone, darling. Mm, I'm struggling against giving in to a first impression, especially when it was so unmistakably unfavorable. Yeah, give up. He was awful so afraid people will laugh at him. And they probably will, starting with me. <laughs> Toddy, let's send to his mother and give her a rousing welcome to Ivy. That's a very good idea. Yeah. We'll, we'll salute the errant mother who abandoned son, grandchildren, and security and do everything to encourage her delinquency. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll give added support to the old observation that uh, just because there is a little snow on the roof, it doesn't mean the fire is out in the house. <laughs> Sit down, Mrs. Yates. Dr. Hall will be right in. Thank you, Mrs. Hall. It was very sweet of Dr. Hall to invite me here. I've always admired him. And you too, my dear. Me? Oh, Mrs. Yates. Oh, I knew you was Victoria Cromwell. It seems only yesterday that I visited London and saw you in a musical called Much Obliged, My Lady. Uh, much Obliged, My Lady. Well, it only lasted three weeks. It was a dreadful little play. The, <laughs> the critic suggested we change the title from Much Obliged, My Lady to Don't Mention It. <laughs> <laughs> well, I thought you were lovely. <laughs> Tell me, why did you leave the stage? Dr. Hall. Oh, that's a very good answer, my dear. Brief, but adequate. Yeah, well, there never was any question. Until I asked. Hmm? <laughs> well, I never could oh, resist. Oh, yes, I'm very sorry to have kept you waiting. Why? Why? Waiting is very restful, Dr. Hall. People should learn how to wait. I know that punctuality is supposed to be a virtue. But why? Well, it's, uh, it's usually expeditious to be punctual when it means to be prompt. But if we are merely being punctilious to follow the fine points of etiquette and ceremony and for no other reason, then, of course, we can become a slave to time. Well, since you have such a sensible approach to the matter of time, Dr. Hall, why do you have classroom buzzers buzzing at such arbitrary intervals? Uh, arbitrary intervals. Yes. Let the individual instructors wing their buzzers when they reach a dull spot or finish what they have to say. <laughs> As it is, they always buzz right in the most interesting places, or else they fail to buzz while the professor fills out the hour with senseless chatter. Well, of course, there'd be a little problem of asking all the instructors to be interesting for the same 
length of time. Yeah, it's an interesting suggestion, Mrs. Yates, but uh, <laughs> you are picturing some ideal institution of learning in which the eager mind is untrammeled by the restrictions of the club, in which a passage from uh, Shakespeare or James takes precedence over the passage of time. <laughs> it's an attractive conception, I must say. People talk about killing time. It's time that kills people. I don't want a clock winding me up. <laughs> <laughs> when you feel like striking 12, you want to do it even if it's only 6. <laughs> Certainly. The world would be a lot more fun if both hands on the clock were the same length. <laughs> oh, that's, that's, that's another interesting thought. <laughs> hmm. uh, <laughs> Mrs. Yates, you're a refreshing freshman. May we say welcome to Ivy. Thank you, Dr. Hall. Why do you think I chose Ivy? You see, Mrs. Hall, I've heard your husband on the radio. He didn't know it, but he made up my mind for me about Camellia. He started me thinking again. And it's awfully hard to think for long if you're sitting in a rocking chair. So I said to myself, Felicia, if you don't want to go off your rocker, get off it. <laughs> That's what you mean. Whenever I sit in one, my head begins to nod, and I, I feel I should bring out my tatting, only I don't know how to tat. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. Why, I just finished a whole set of doilies for my daughter-in-law in my philosophy class. <laughs> <laughs> About the only thing I got out of that course so far. <laughs> Dr. Hall, don't you think a professor of philosophy should know Plato's first name? <laughs> well, of course. Uh, mm. <laughs> Plato's first name. Yes. That's odd. I never thought of it before. <laughs> yeah, oh, I, I, I suppose it's one of those familiar things you forget because, uh, because you've known it so long. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, if that's true, at least five professors in this college ought to take memory courses. Not one of them is. Even Professor Castle, my faculty advisor, he even blushed. But he was very nice to me. So has you been. And thank you for inviting me to see you. Hardy? Hmm. Plato's first name. <laughs> now, what was Plato's first name? I thought it was Joe. <laughs> oh, you, you must be thinking of his best-known translator, Joe it. No, he, however, he wasn't called Joe either because his first name was Benjamin. Well, that makes sense. Mm. Yeah, he, he, he was born circa 427 and died circa 347. Oh, circa Plato. Well, it's a very pretty name. Oh, no, 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 Vicky. <laughs> Vicky. Circa is a, a Latin... Hey, you're word. stalling. Come on, confess. You've forgotten it. Oh, it's more serious than that. I don't think I ever knew it. <laughs> Why, William Todd Hunter Hall, and to think that the first time you kissed me, we were standing in the shadow of Plato's bust in the British Museum. Oh, I know, my darling. That I remember. But not to know his first name. College president, a bigger bust than Plato. <laughs> folks are enthusiastic about Schlitz beer, and just about everyone who is has his own way of expressing that enthusiasm. I take Calhoun Gaddy, who is working on his master's degree here at Ivy. Well, I bumped into Cal on a campus the other day. Hi there, Mr. Carpenter. Hi, Cal. It's a funny thing I was thinking about you last night. So? Me and some of the fellas was talking about beer. Well, now, that's a subject dear to my heart. Oh, and mine too. Well, we was trying to decide just when a beer tastes the best. One of the boys says during the beer frame when he's bowling. Another boy likes his after around the golf bat. Well, they asked me, and I just couldn't say. Slits beer suits me fine just any time. But the time I appreciated the slits the most happened during the war. They moved my outfit back to the rear area and gave us a choice of a shower, a hot meal, or a can of slits. Oh, man. 
before I'd done another thing, I sat down right under a tree and enjoyed myself the best taste in beer ever. <laughs> I'll bet it was good. Oh, it sure was. And get this, this is in Germany, the home of good beer. But that can of slits tasted like the best beer in the world. Oh, it was just like being home again. Well, okay, Cal, lots of people have found that Schlitz beer tastes best wherever they are, whatever the time. So many people, in fact, that Schlitz is first in sales in the USA. That well-known taste has made Schlitz the most popular beer in history. Incidentally, Cal, you and the other vets might like to know that our fighting men in Korea are getting their share of Schlitz beer, too. <laughs> Turn to Ivy a few days later, where Dr. Hall has already spent a good deal of his lunch hour holding the telephone in one hand and his head in the other, while listening to the importunate voice of Mr. Wellman, chairman of Ivy's Board of Governors. Naturally, I'm disturbed. Addison Yates was one of my hot prospects. That is, I've been working on. I mean, he has been interested in Ivy's building fund for some time. And now this unfortunate, this, this mother of his. Are you listening, Dr. Hall? Yes, Mr. Wellman. After all, you, you must respect a man's feelings, especially when he's thinking of his mother. And Dr. Hall, Mr. Yates is only thinking of his mother. Of course, I am thinking of... of... What did you say, Dr. Hall? There's nothing, Mr. Wellman. So in my modest way, I have tried to mediate. I have explained to Mr. Yates that, of course, there are exceptions. Uh, but Mr. Wellman, And Mrs. I... Yates, I mean his wife. Uh, Mr. Yates' wife. Uh, the younger Mrs. Yates. The elder Mrs. Yates' daughter-in-law. Her! <laughs> she is generously willing to forget under certain conditions. I mean, I, I assured him that, that you, that is, uh, a reconsideration of the situation, and so as he requested. Uh, Mr. Wellman, I don't believe... Fortunately, I... we still have time to get rid of, uh, or that is, I mean, to save his mother from making a fool of Mr. Yates, and, and that is, after all, a humane thing to do. Humane, Dr. Hall. Uh, but, Mr. Wellman... I told him... Uh, we could meet with you at your house at three o'clock. What is it, Dr. Hall? <laughs> A waste of time, Mr. Wellman. Then let's make it two o'clock. Good night. Goodbye, Dr. Hall. <laughs> One. Uh, Vicky, Mr. Wellman just set a new world's record for the hundred-word dash. Yeah. <laughs> the most revealing conversation from your end, about 15 eloquent, but Mr. Wellman's. Mm, alas, <laughs> Mr. Wellman won't take but for an answer. Uh, La Faire Yates grows apace in his mind. Oh, that's not a mind. That's an outboard motor with a white moustache. <laughs> well, he, he suggested that I... Uh, don't move, Victoria. I'll get it this week. <laughs> Ah, Professor Castle. Dr. Hall. It's good to see you. Come in. Thank you, I will. Oh, Mrs. Hall. Hello, Professor Castle. I hear that your child psychology course is a big hit this year. Standing room only, huh? Well, that's not surprising, considering the increase of young married students on the campus. They want information and advice. Yeah, Freudian interpretations of why Willie scribbles on the bedroom wallpaper. <laughs> well, that's why I'm here, Dr. Hall. I am a faculty advisor, and I need advice. As a psychologist, I'm supposed to be able to understand problems of adjustment, but my field is child psychology, and my present problem is not a child. Could she be a grandmother? So you've met Mrs. Yates. <laughs> and I understand you don't know Plato's first name either. <laughs> uh, I also couldn't give her a completely satisfactory answer to why children have two sets of teeth. Of course, I can describe the process in detail, but I can't tell her why it happens. Now, the question why, which Mrs. Yates uses promiscuously, can only be answered, really, in terms of faith, opinion, and belief. Has anyone any beliefs about Plato's first name? Well, that's a what question, not a why. Oh, why don't you know what? It is. <laughs> You'd be surprised how many times I've looked in the encyclopedia since Mrs. Yates has been here. Who <laughs> has? <laughs> and you want to know a secret? There's an awful lot in my Britannica that doesn't know. So for me, that sounds like treason. <laughs> uh, Professor Castle, uh, if you don't mind the perpetual quiz, what's the problem? I have a strong feeling that Mrs. Yates is disappointed in us that we haven't given her as much as she expected. As she puts it, our child psychology course 
is like learning to play the piano without a piano. Well, there's more to the problem than Mrs. Yates. Have you ever met her son? I haven't met him. And I gather from your lifted eyebrow that I better quit while I'm ahead. Yeah. <laughs> if you'd met him, you'd understand why his mother's taking child psychology. <laughs> the son is almost as interesting as the mother, Professor. She's still growing up. He stopped at age 13, even though he's a father. Mm. A childish father. A lollipopper. <laughs> oh, uh, must you go, Professor? <laughs> Can you blame him, Lollipop? <laughs> and so, Mr. Yates, thanks to Mr. Wellman, we have a chance to prove that different points of view can often be resolved when we review them. I know that you're interested in your mother's well-being and happiness, and Mr. Wellman has informed me that you are also interested in Ivy College. Now, now, it seems to me that there is no reason why... Those... I'm so delighted you asked me to drop by this afternoon, Dr. Hall, because I wanted to ask you a question. Well, I... I would have been bitterly disappointed otherwise, Mrs. Yates. What is it? Dr. Hall... Why is red an exciting color? Uh, why is red? Oh, dear, 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 dear. That's a political question, Will, and I'd refuse to answer on the grounds of incriminating myself. Nevertheless, <laughs> nevertheless, it's important to ask such questions. For if categorical statements, aesthetic or otherwise, were left unchallenged, there would be no advance in knowledge and no increase of wisdom. My father used to say that a, a question mark was a button hook which is thrust through the eyelet of ignorance to grasp the button of truth. Oh, I don't think I ever could stop asking questions, Dr. Hall. I listen to my grandchildren's questions, but I can't answer them. Because they're my own, too. Mm. I doubt whether the entire faculty of Ivy, plus John Kieran, FPA, and Arlene Francis could do that job. <laughs> now, but they're important questions. Each child is a Columbus discovering a new world. Mm. And we must at least encourage the venture. Yes. Yeah. If our little Columbuses can't get any answers, the world will seem pretty flat. <laughs> <laughs> but I really want to have some answers for them. I thought I'd find them in child psychology. But now I'm confused. I miss something. The children. We talk about them, study them, classify them, and they're not even around to defend themselves. Well, I'm glad you've brought this up, Mrs. Yates, because it has a direct bearing on a decision I just made. I had a long talk with your son this afternoon. Addison? Uh-huh. So he did come here. And that's why you've asked me to come over. Yes, he feels... You don't have to tell me how he feels. He tried his best to discourage me when I first decided to come to Ivy. Addison is my own son, but in his case, IQ doesn't mean intelligence quotient. It means incessantly quibbling. <laughs> well, I, uh, I... I think you underestimate him. You see, we did reach an agreement. One of my pet projects for Ivy has been the establishment of an experimental school for children along the lines of the renowned Yale Clinic of Child Development. Your son has become interested in this. So interested that he is going to make our plan an accomplished fact. You are going to have a school here for children so that we'll all know what we're talking about. Why? Why, that's wonderful. But Addison, you mean my son Addison is giving money to Ivy for that? Oh, ah, I understand. So that was the price he put on my head. Well, Mrs. Oh, Jackson. it's worth it. You made a fair trade, Dr. Hall, and I admire you for it. But isn't this funny? The one thing that I missed here at college is what my son is giving you to get me out. <laughs> Who said anything about getting you out? Well, you should have seen your son's face when Dr. Hall described the importance of the part you'll play. I pointed out that this idea stemmed from you, and that both Professor Castle and I believe that you would be indispensable as chief consultant in such a school. But, Dr. Hall, I'm an old lady. I'm a grandmother. I don't know... A... Oh, dear, what have I done? <laughs> Your son was as proud as punch. You'd have thought he'd thought of it. Yes, he would be. 
You're both being very kind about Addison, and I'm overwhelmed by what he's done. But we must face it. Addison is a snob. <laughs> I, I wouldn't put it that way. I think that he has been genuinely concerned about you. That he wanted to protect you from some imaginary derision. No, I think Addison wanted to protect himself, Dr. Hall. He's pretty high-handed, you know. But he finally gave up. Ah, perhaps we could derive a lesson. Maybe a great many people who appear high-handed are merely trying to surrender. <laughs> Party. Yes, my love. How are you doing with Joe Plato? Or is it Mike? Oh, I hope it's Mike. Mike Plato, it's nice. <laughs> it wasn't either Joe or Mike. I found it. Where? Well, it wasn't in the Encyclopedia Britannica. Or if it was, I couldn't find it. No, dear, it was in every man's encyclopedia, third edition. And now, if you'll excuse me, I have some correspondence. Oh, no, and... you don't, bud. Huh? Jim. <laughs> what, 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 what? Plato, you can't leave me hanging like this. If it wasn't Joe <laughs> or Mike, what was it? Um, Aristocles. Now, there's a letdown. Aristocles, a common name like that. <laughs> well, <laughs> now that that's settled, I have a question. Yes? Yes. What I've been thinking of for a whole week. Why is a plurality different from a majority? Um... Plurality. Plurality. Uh, uh, pack my bag, darling. I'm spending the night at the Y. <laughs> the Halls of Ivy, starring Mr. and Mrs. Ronald Coleman, has been presented by Schlitz, the bear that made Milwaukee famous. <laughs> The taste of Schlitz, the taste so many people prefer, has made Schlitz beer first in sales in the USA. Why don't you two enjoy the most popular beer in history? Next time, every time, ask for Schlitz beer. Now, here again are Mr. and Mrs. Ronald Coleman. Good night, everybody. Good night from all of us. And from our sponsor, the Joseph Schlitz Brewing Company of Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and its thousands of friendly dealers throughout the nation. Good night. Good night. Good night. We'll be seeing you next week at this same time at the Halls of Ivy, starring Mr. and Mrs. Ronald Coleman. Mr. Wellman is played by Herbert Butterfield. Also in our cast were Jane Morgan, Joseph Kearns, and Norman Field. Tonight's script was written by Barbara and Milton Merlin and Don Quinn. Music composed and conducted by Henry Russell. The Halls of Ivy was created by Don Quinn, directed by Nat Wolf, and presented to the Joseph Schlitz Brewing Company of Milwaukee, Wisconsin, who invites you to enjoy on television the Schlitz Playhouse of Stars with Helen Hayes, John Payne, Margaret Sullivan, and more of the brightest names of Hollywood and Broadway. See your newspaper for time and chat. Ken Carpenter speaking. Oh, we love the halls of ivy that surround.